everyone. It's great to see everybody here today. Will you stand and worship the Lord with us? I just wanted to encourage you all. Um, I found that when I'm, up on, when I'm not up on stage here and I'm just, you know, out in the crowd, um, I find so many times as I walk in those doors, it's really hard to just kind of unload what I've been carrying. Um, these last couple of months have been heavy for all of us. And it just, you know, I just, I always found just such a difficulty engaging, you know, it took a couple of minutes to kind of ramp my mind up. Um, so I just want to encourage you all as, as we get into worship, leave your burdens at the door, lay them down at the feet of Christ. Whatever worship looks like for you, whatever that is, that, that I want you to be free to worship the Lord this morning, whether it's raising your hands or dancing or flying flags or just sitting reflectfully, whatever that is, I just want to encourage you to, to lay your burdens down and be able to worship Christ freely. buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my tomb till I met you
worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Let's sing that again. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you.
just want to pause for a minute now uh, to release our children to their classes. You can head out the rear of the auditorium there, and the rest of us, we're going to re-engage in worship. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand
standing on the rock, my firm foundation, my firm foundation. Sing that again. And I am standing on the rock. I am standing in your love. And I am standing on the rock. My firm foundation. My firm foundation. My fear. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. It's my pleasure to declare that there is a power available to us today. Let me say it again. And by the way, it doesn't matter how you feel about it, right? Whatever Bronley referred to, whatever you carried in this week, whatever you're carrying now, whatever you face ahead of you, I need to declare a truth over you that the Spirit is speaking in the room today. There is a power available to us. Put the shame aside, put the busyness aside, come on. Of all the powers that the Bible talks about, of all the powers, the Bible doesn't talk the most about the power it took to create the world, although you gotta admit that's pretty amazing. The Bible doesn't reflect too much on Psalm 2 where God says, put all the might of the nations together on a scale and it doesn't register against me and my anointed one. The most talked about power in the Bible isn't his power to wrap all this up and take us home one day. The most talked about power in the Bible is this, the power of Christ raising from the grave. It's the most talked about. And it gets crazier. Ephesians 1.19 says this, and the same power that rose him from the grave is at work in you. Amen. Fear doesn't stand a chance. Your issues don't stand a chance. Your shame cannot stand when his power comes. This is how David wanted you to rest in that. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He journeys me to quiet waters. He restores my soul. And to get to higher waters, to get to greener pastures are tough paths sometimes, aren't they? But we're gonna talk about trust today and we're gonna invite trust. So would you join with me in prayer? Jesus, we come to you and we ask you to release trust in this room today. Trust in who you are. Trust in the power that is in work with us, within us. Thank you, Jesus. You're welcome here. Amen. Hey, before you sit down, look at someone in the eye and give them that hello face or that awkward COVID elbow bump. Um, <laughs> tough transition, huh? And while you're doing that, can you guys give it up for the worship team? I mean, they, they are above average. Honestly, some of us have microphones strapped to our heads or in our hands. And we're called ministers, but that, they're, they're doing something for us, isn't it? They're slowing us down. They're reminding us where God sits and how good that is for all of us. Hi, I'm Jim Ehrman. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. It's good to see you all, ECC, and wherever you're from, right? If you're one of our regular attenders, regular members, hello. Whether you're watching this online, hey, if you're visiting, I call you a COVID refugee. If you're part of another church that hasn't quite figured out exactly how they're going to re-engage. You know, we welcome COVID refugees, and we, we have this belief that 42, 43 years ago, 12 people met in a basement of a nearby farm, and a seed was planted, and that mustard seed now has grown into a tree, and many birds can come and rest in its branches, right? And we pray that you take a piece of us wherever you're headed, whether you're visiting, if you're looking for a church, we are above average. I mean, I'm not going to tell you exactly how far, but we're pretty good. Um, we're a decent shot. Come on. Give us a shot, you know, taste and see. 
Um, and we want to welcome you. You're always welcome here. And uh, we, I particularly want to say welcome to all of those of you who help keep this tree what it is so other birds can rest in it. I think we look past the regular people who are serving and putting their forces behind what it takes to be the kingdom right now. Thank you for what you do. And on top of that, I just want to ask you to fill out the Connect card, would you? Now, you might think that that's just some piece of paper that kind of gets filed away and we keep track and we turn it into heaven one day and it has to do with whether or not you get in. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with us knowing what's going on in your life. And would you please give us a prayer request? Every single week, those prayer requests get put into a spreadsheet and sent to a prayer team that prays over that entire list. And I'm going to particularly ask some of you who've been coming here for a long time and you think you may be past turning in prayer requests, right? That point where you just want this to be an outreach church and caring for others. You know what? I want to actually do what we want the world to do. We want to reach out to others and to our God for prayer and help. Could you put a prayer request down this week. I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to read through them and pray through every single one this week, even the confidential ones. But we won't go into all that, right? So also on top of that, would you also consider, we have, this is one of those change of seasons. Anyone feel it when kids are going back to school and you feel that slight turn in the weather when you get up some mornings? I don't know about you. I sensed it even this morning when I walked outside. You know, it's a time where we even as a church launch some new rhythms. So if you've even ever thought of being involved in a connect group, now's your time. We have 48 sub-communities of this church. Face the facts. Whether there's 12, 1,500, or 2,000 of us to get together here to celebrate on Sunday mornings, we need close connection and community. And our connect groups are a chance for you to take one step toward that. Would you go to our website and check out those groups? There's also growth groups, which meet either Monday or Thursday nights for six to eight weeks, and you can dive into a topic. And we also want to let you know that tomorrow Tomorrow, registration closes for the Institute of Christian Leadership. That's the partnership that we launched with the seminary where I was dean for a bunch of years. And it's a partnership where you can take college, excuse me, graduate level classes underneath professors. And we're, teach we're teaching two classes this time around. Old Testament survey, which kind of goes over the whole Old Testament arc, teaches you about different kinds of, let's just say, like Hebrew poetry and how that might affect the way you read the Bible. And the second class is going to be on evangelism and discipleship. How has the church done it? down through the ages? What's it mean to be trying to do it in a post-Christian West in the 21st century? What's it mean to bring your skills out in evangelism and discipleship, even if you don't think you have them, right? Let Come and let us uh, instruct you in some of those things, and tomorrow is the deadline for that, so look it up. Now, before I go any further, one last announcement. In two weeks, parents pay attention in particular, two weeks is Step Up Sunday. I didn't even know what that was. They had to tell me what that meant, right? Step up Sunday. That means that your kids or your young people are moving up to the next class. Keep that in mind in two weeks. So if you signed them up today and they look like they failed a grade, we don't think that, right? If you signed them up today and they're going into sixth grade this year and they came up fifth grade, we're not speaking anything over your child like, no, we don't think he or she was ready, right? It's in two weeks you're going to see the computer systems will, will up step your kids up, and we're looking forward to that now. Before I go any further, let's talk about the testimony for today. It's one of our youth, Isabel Musser. And after she's done giving her testimony, would you clap for her? And then also, would you welcome our minister today of the word, Wes Seacrest? So when this video is done and, and, and we're done here in the goodness of what God's done in her life, I want you to give it up for Wes Seacrest as he comes. Sound good? Let's roll. It was starting in January 2020 this year, and I had a lot of sleeping anxiety. I just couldn't sleep because I felt so alone. I knew that, like, everyone was with me in this world but I just felt so alone in my like spiritual life so after a week I started praying and I would go to my like parents bedroom and they would pray for me after a couple of weeks it kind of got better but I felt like I was still alone and one day at church we had this worship session in um, Kingdom Kids and I started like worshiping by myself and then one of my teachers they came up to me and they asked if I had anything that I needed prayer for and I asked for peace and that I felt like to feel calm. A couple nights after I was like really worshiping and praying and I ended up standing on my bed and saying to the devil that God is with me and I'm not alone. I started to feel like God was with me and I had someone to help me go through this. And so after that, I had no sleeping anxiety and I felt totally at peace and calm. You're never alone. Like sometimes the devil will try to like get you and grab you and he would like, keep you trying to hide your light. And you just gotta 
but let go of that and pray and just trust God through the process and that you're never alone, that like, God is always with you. Amen. Oh, what a great testimony. Thanks, guys. I'm looking forward to sharing God's Word with you today. And I got some props here. Uh, these big pill bottles. What on earth do these mean? Well, we'll get to them here just in a moment. But, you know, I really appreciate Isabel's testimony. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, that we overcome or we, we uh, overcome the forces of darkness, right, by two things. The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood of the Lamb, in other words, it's God's part and then our part. And I so appreciated Isabel's uh, testimony there and just the freedom and breakthrough that comes through that. Well, before I get into the message and what these props mean and all of that, there's two things that are on my heart that I would just like to invite you to pray with me uh, about this morning. And the first is Pastor Kevin, as you know, is on sabbatical, a season of that, just a few weeks left in that season. And him and Stephanie, his wife, are in Pittsburgh today. Uh, they were sharing, actually not sharing, they're receiving, uh, participating in another congregation there. Uh, Kevin went there specifically, part of his sabbatical, he wanted to do some research. And this was a particular congregation that had some tools and resources that he felt would be very helpful for us. And so he went uh, to investigate that, to check that out. And so, if Kevin's watching online, bless you and Stephanie, but uh, we also want to pray for them. And then secondly, the second thing on my heart is I really want to pray for back to school. And I know that has been quite a stressful season. Uh, parents, teachers, decisions, students of all age, and I, it's going from, you know, what do we do for schooling this year and homeschooling and cyber schooling and hybrid models, and it, it looks very different this year for sure, and I know there's a lot of stress and a lot of uh, anxiety that's been created around that, so today I just want to pray. I know many students already started school and some are starting yet tomorrow, but in the midst of all of that, I just want us to pause on purpose and pray for teachers and students and parents. And so I would just invite you, as part of the authority that we have in Jesus Christ, would you just stand with me in prayer as we stand on our firm foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and let's pray together around these two things. God, this morning, we just want to take a moment and on purpose, Lord, just come before your amazing throne of grace and mercy. And I want to thank you for what you're doing in the midst of it all. And God, there's two things that are on my heart this morning. God, first of all, I just want to pray for parents, moms, dads, students of all ages, boys and girls, teachers. God, those that are providing a variety of resources. God, what a stressful season this has been. What a challenging season and a lot of ad, uh, adaptions needed to happen. And so God, I just pray for every student and every teacher and every parent in this room, God, that there would be no loss of learning this year. God, I pray even according to Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God, this is our prayer over all going back to school. God, also in my heart and on our heart today is we just want to pray a blessing over Pastor Kevin and his wife, Stephanie. God, we're so grateful for their leadership here at Effort of Community Church. Grateful they have this time to unplug and refresh, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would blow refreshment into their hearts. We ask you, Lord, for just divine revelation and that you would speak to them, Lord, continually in this season. We pray, Lord, that no weapon formed against them can stand or prosper. And we pray according to Ephesians 3, verse 20, that you, O oh God, would do immeasurably more in them and through them in this time than we could ever think or ask or imagine. And so I pray blessing over Kevin and Stephanie today by the power of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Thank you for joining me in prayer. You may be seated. 
I want to open this message today by just showing you a short video uh, that was done by North Point Resources, which we were using uh, by permission, which sets up where we really want to go in this message. so angry about everything. I wonder why some people get healed from sickness and others don't. I wonder how many kids I'm gonna have and when I'm gonna get married. I wonder what life will be like for my family in five years. Well, basically, I'm wondering if I'll just make the right choices. I wonder if my kids are going to have a good life. I just want them to be happy. And I wonder if, if there's really somebody out there um, guiding us. I would also say that I'm a religious person, so I wonder about God and why um, things happen. I wonder if I'm going to have a very fulfilled life and do what I'm supposed to do. So what about you? What do you wonder? As you listen to those voices and as you listen to those questions, what do you wonder? Regardless of age, regardless of experiences in life and even where we're at in life and seasons of life, we all wonder. And it starts at a very early age. As I remember my children at a very, very young age often asking, Daddy, why? The questions of wonder. This year, more than usual, I have found myself wrestling with numerous wonder questions. And I find myself often going to my Heavenly Father saying, Daddy, why? With my wonder questions. It was a few days after Thanksgiving uh, last year, and I was sitting with the Lord and journaling some things that were on my heart, and I got a very strong impression from the Holy Spirit. I, I believe that 2020 was going to be a year of storming. Well, at that time, I had a couple of ideas of what I thought that might like, but I'm thankful that God veiled from me, from us, what that all would look like. And, and in December, we as an executive team spent a day in a, in a retreat together, and I shared that uh, word with them. But little did any of us have any idea what this year, the storms this year would bring us, the, how wide they were, how deep they would be. Now, not all storms are bad, right? If you're like me, you like a good thunderstorm. You know, from my house, I, I know the direction they come from. There's been times I've, I've just been out in them, if you will, right? <laughs> Shouldn't be, but I am, you know. Just enjoying the beauty as you see the clouds forming and the amazing power and the display and those storms kind of blow through and blow away. And, and those storms are awesome because you can see the power and it has very little effect on me. And they actually, in some way, give me energy. But then on the other hand, there are storms that take away my energy. It rains and blows and unleashes a torrential downpour of inches and the water level begins to rise and the water begins to seep in the walls of my basement and pretty soon the basement is covered and a few times I've been brought to tears and frustration and just overwhelming discouragement by a flooded basement, ruined carpet, furniture, and walls. Storms, we all face them. Whether physical, spiritual, mental, relational, storms touch every single one of us. In the natural, 
I don't understand why my neighbor's basement stays dry and mine floods occasionally. Doesn't make sense to me. And spiritually, in this pandemic of COVID-19 and racism and political divide, why is it that some followers of Jesus Christ seem to have grown closer to the Lord and others have plateaued or even feel that God is a lot further away? This is a very honest question. It's a good question. It's a question that came out of our feedback when we surveyed you as a congregation asking for some of your feedback uh, from learnings throughout this year. And I know that this honest question does not come from one that is on cloud nine with Jesus, right? Because when we're in that place, we're usually not asking this question. The ones of us that ask this question are when we're struggling or we feel God is distant or we wonder where he is or why things are so tough in our spiritual life. Meanwhile, in the middle of all the stuff, we're still wondering when would end, what will be next. I'd like to invite you into two things this morning. First of all, I'd like to invite you into a Bible study, looking at a particular storm in the scriptures that I believe have amazing application for us today. That's the first thing I'm going to invite you into. And then secondly, I want to invite you into a remedy for our storm-tossed souls. A prescription, if you will, that I guarantee will be a help to you. But first, a Bible study. I invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. And I do encourage you, I know we all carry Bibles electronically, but I do invite you, bring your Bible, a hard copy to church. It's good to flip the pages and to make notes occasionally. Uh, bring, bring your Bibles to church, encourage that. But follow with me either on your uh, device or either uh, on your pages of Scripture to Mark chapter 4. And you may know the story that I'm going to refer to. Maybe you don't. But it's known as Jesus calming the storm. Now before I read from the text and we do a little bit of a Bible study in it, there's a couple, there's a little bit of a background, a setting that I want you to understand. The setting for the story that we're about to read, which Jesus calms the storm, is Jesus had spent all day with the crowds with his disciples. He had spent all day teaching, answering questions, answering wonder questions. It was a long and tiring day, and, and it was time to step away. It would be like you and I having a long day at work, on our feet all day, walking all day, sitting behind a computer screen all day, answering phones all day, whatever it is, teaching all day, whatever you do, right, all day from beginning of the day to the end of the day with hardly any breaks, and you're tired. And finally, five o'clock comes. It, it, time to check out, right? Time to step away. And that's really the setting for the story. Mark chapter 4, I want to pick it up at beginning at verse 35. And it says this, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. I want to pause. I want to do a little bit of a Bible study here because... It's so easy to jump to the storm part, right? But we're not there yet. I think it's important just to pause and understand and extract a couple of truths in what we just read. And the first truth that I want to remind us of in this setting, ahead of this story, ahead of this storm, is that the disciples were right where God wanted them to be. Another way that we would say it in church life is they were right in the center of God's will. They were following Jesus wholeheartedly. Jesus told them, get in the boat, and they got in the boat. So they were obeying wholeheartedly. This is important to note in our study because sometimes we think, or we get this idea, maybe, that, that, that storms really don't happen to those that follow the Lord or in his will. And actually, that's not true. Now, obviously, storms can come by sin in our life and stuff that we do that's against God. But, but what I'm talking about today is, is not really the setting. 
They are with Jesus. They are in his will. They're, they're following him. Another Old Testament example would be Job. Even God said of Job that he's a blameless man. He's upright, a man who fears God, one who flees from evil. And yet Job faced a massive storm that left him with many wonder questions. So I want us to understand that the disciples were exactly where God wanted them to be. Secondly, Jesus was right there with them. In a moment, the disciples are going to get really focused on the storm, and then after they exhaust everything that they knew to do, it was only then that they turned to Jesus, who was with them all the time. All those, you know, may know the story, was sleeping in the middle of that storm. Uh, This helps me tremendously in my storms to consider that Jesus may not be as concerned about the storm as I am. And knowing that the disciples were in the middle of God's word helps me also to realize that even though sometimes I question, is this storm, God, why is this happening? I thought I was in the center of your will, and yet the storm is still happening. These questions that continue to surface. And so here's the scene, right? The disciples are in the will of God. Secondly, Jesus is right there with them. And so now together, they're in a boat and they're working their way to the other side of the lake. Now, if you didn't know any of the story, this sounds like a Sunday fun day, right? In the boat with Jesus, chilling and grilling some fish, perhaps, right? On the Sea of Galilee. I've been on the Sea of Galilee. It's an amazing place. Not in a storm. I wouldn't want to be there. But while in the will of God and with Jesus among them, they encountered a storm. Let's pick up the story. Verse 37. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, said to the waves, quiet. Be still. Then the wave died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified. And they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, I'd like for us to, there's so many things in this text, but I want to just focus on on three things as we continue in this Bible study around this story. I'd like to suggest to you that there's not one storm in this text. There's not two storms in this text. There's actually three storms in this text. Let me show them to you. The first storm is probably the most obvious one. It's a circumstantial storm. The disciples had absolutely no control over the wind, over the rain, over the waves. They had no control over the storm, friends. It did not matter that they were professional fishermen. It did not matter at all that they knew the Sea of Galilee like the back of their hand. They've seen storms before. It didn't matter that they were even obeying the voice of the Lord. It was a circumstantial storm that completely caught them off guard and it was out of their control and they had no influence on the timing of it. Nothing they did or did not do caused this storm. Nonetheless, this storm brought them very quickly to a place of complete helplessness. They're caught in a storm beyond their control with waves coming in the boat faster than they can get the water out of the boat. A circumstantial storm they did not choose, but they had to face. Sound familiar? This leads us to the second storm in this text, and that is an emotional storm. There's an emotional storm here. I want you to see it. In fact, the text says in verse 37 that the storm surge was filling the boat to the point that these professional fishermen were now afraid of drowning. This is serious. Professional fishermen afraid of drowning. That's a storm. 
This circumstantial storm beyond their control triggered some very raw emotions within them. It came to the surface really quickly. Fear and panic and helplessness and frustration and we're going to fail at this and, and, and anger. The very thing they knew how to do, navigate the seas, was about to take them under to defeat them. And friends, I think this is helpful to know that when faced with circumstantial storms in our lives, we often encounter early on in those storms of circumstance some emotional instability. Our emotions get stirred and tossed. And when a storm hits us beyond our control, it creates an emotional storm, and all of a sudden, we're dealing with emotions, we're dealing with stuff rising up inside of us, and it even is leaking out, and stuff that we're not that proud of. But it's real, it's intense, it's raw emotion. And more often than not, that what comes to the surface in those emotions are actually things that are already part of our heart. I confess it's been true for me in this season. Navigating our current storms has brought things to light in my heart that I am not thrilled about at all. In fact, I won't even tell you what they are because <laughs> they're between me and God. But I've recognized these things that come into my soul, that comes into my spirit, and I so dislike bailing water out of my basement. And I so dislike being caught in a storm I didn't ask for. On the other hand, I have come to understand, friends, that the Holy Spirit often uses storms in my life to detox my soul. There's a purpose in storms. This is critical because choosing on how you respond to a circumstantial storm in your life, depending on how you choose to react to it, could either bring toxins into your soul or if you allow God into those places and spaces, there can be a detoxing that can take place. Friends, emotions are going to be a part of any storm we face, but they're tied to yet something deeper. Notice the progression here. Circumstantial storm, there was an emotional storm. This led to the third storm that we see in this text, and that was a spiritual storm. Storms start with a circumstance we didn't ask for. We get caught up with a mixed bag of emotions, which can be both internalized and we also express, which sets in question some faith issues that leave us wondering. The disciples did this in verse 38. Notice, listen to, uh, to the, they were terrified, right? Drowning, that's emotions. And they woke Jesus up who was sleeping and listened to the anger, listened to the hurt, the, the, the twinges of that in their voice. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Accusation, anger, frustration. Come on, God, you see this storm we're in. You're in the boat too, but you're sleeping for crying out loud. Don't you care about us? Won't you do something? Jesus gets up. In this case, he does do something about the circumstantial storm. He rebukes the wind. He spoke to the wave. There's a whole Bible study in those two things, by the way. And peace returned to the sea. But it doesn't say peace returned to the disciples' hearts. Just their circumstance changed. And instantly that storm stopped, but the emotions that the disciples still had to deal with, the faith questions that the disciples still had, that carried and followed them because we see that through the, through the ongoing passages of Scripture throughout the Gospels. In fact, verse 41 of the text, they even asked the question, who is this? What just happened? Even Jesus keyed in on their spiritual storm in verse 40. After he calmed the storm, he says, do you still have no faith? See, it's a spiritual storm. Faith, trusting God, friends, it is a big deal. Even Jesus in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, he wondered as he was talking with his disciples, he said, when I return, I wonder, will I find faith on the earth? It is true that 
Many times our faith questions don't stop after the storm passes, the circumstantial storm. And many times because we want to move on from the storm, we don't continue to do the harder work of allowing God's spirit to deal with those emotions in us that that are often tied to a deeper faith question that God wants us to grow in. Now, all of us are facing significant storms at the moment. I could name them, but I don't have to because we're all facing similar storms. We can't change it as much as we'd like to. We can pray about it. We didn't even ask for it. We can't control, we can control, however, how we handle it, how we respond to it. We, we can, to some degree, have, have an opportunity to grow either in toxins or detoxing our soul with the Lord. I believe God often uses storms as part of his purpose to draw us closer to him, to depend on him, to to kick out the props, if you will. Going back to a message Kevin shared earlier this year in this series, right? So that we would depend on him. On the other hand, I also know that the devil loves to sweep in during a storm and tries to push me or drag me further from God by asking questions or even doubting myself or doubting that I'm following God wholeheartedly or putting confusion in my mind. See, those are all works of the enemy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And yet Jesus has come to give us life. So how then do we best navigate storms? What what do we do with our emotions? How do we handle these faith questions that we have? What are we to do when we wonder, Jesus, are you still in this boat? And if so, why are you sleeping? At least that may be what it feels like. You know, friends, I don't know about you, but storms are not easy. I know Staples makes this easy button. The button works. That was easy. But storms are not easy, are they? We, we don't get through a storm and look back and say, that was easy. Because they're not. Storms aren't easy. But storms have a purpose in our life. In fact, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not easy. Being a follower of Christ isn't easy. In fact, that word disciple is a root word to the word discipline. And so there's some disciplines that I need to put into my life, into my walk with Jesus, in order to continue to survive the storms that come. I believe there's a remedy for our storm-tossed souls, a prescription that works. And I can guarantee it because it's the Word of God. And I'd like to present to you the first suggested remedy for a storm tossed soul. Trust God. It's subscribed by, or Jesus is the doctor, right? It's for whosoever. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him, trusts in him, will have eternal life. Notice that there's endless refills in this. Now, I didn't put on the label. Perhaps I should. You know, take often, take as many, uh, it does say take as many for as long as needed, but, but this is really something you should OD on. <laughs> Maybe that's not a good thing to say in church, but anyway, you, you understand what I'm saying, right? But, but notice, notice the side effects of trusting God. There's peace in the midst of the storm. There's joy. There's stability. There's a confidence that comes. There's overall better health, physically, mentally, spiritually, trusting God. There's a lot of scriptures about trusting God. Let me just give you a quick couple of them. Psalms 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times. Key word, all 
times. You people, pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Another word for believe there is trust. You trust in God, trust also in me. Hebrews 2.13, I will put my trust in Jesus. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not always easy to live the Christian life. It's not always easy. That's why it's called faith. Trusting God in the midst of of the storm. This is one of the remedies, I believe, for a storm tossed soul. But I think there's a second one that I'd like to offer you this morning. And again, this is all over the scriptures. And this one is do good. Do good. Again, Jesus prescribes it. It's whosoever, right? Take as many for as long as needed. But notice the side effects, right? Contentment and happiness and making an eternal difference. Friends, there's something that God has put in every single one of us, and that is a desire to make a difference, to make an eternal difference. And we do that by trusting God and doing good. Listen to a couple of scriptures around do good. Again, it's all over the scriptures, but Luke 6, 27 and 35. Do good to those that hate you. Ouch. Do good to your enemies. Hebrews 13, 16. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Galatians 6, 9 and 10, let us not grow weary in doing good. Let us do good to all people. Similar thought is repeated in 2 Thessalonians 3, 13. Do not grow weary in doing good. 1 Peter 3, 11, they must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Doing good doesn't have to be overcomplicated. Just be kind, be considerate, helpful. Find a way to serve. Find something you can do or some way you can serve someone else and just do it. It was amazing when COVID hit, our phones began ringing off the hook here at the church. What can I do to help? What can I do to help? There's this passion, this desire. I want to do something. I want to be involved. And if you don't know what to do, ask the Holy Spirit to show you, right? Now, in pre-service prayer today, one of Earl, one of the brothers was praying. He's like, Lord, would you just reveal to us today, what, what's the one thing you want to show us to do? <laughs> he had no idea what the message was. Doing good. One thing to do. Ask the Lord to show you. I believe the scriptures teach us that as followers of Jesus Christ, this is really important, we cannot... And we should not separate these two. And let me tell you why. If you are just trying to do good and not putting your trust in the Lord, this means you're lost. Because good works and doing good does not save anybody. Doing good will not get you closer to Jesus. Now, doing good is important, and that's why in a moment I'm going to show you why the two are important, but doing good by itself, listen to what the Bible says. Galatians, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. That's how you're saved. It is not, the scripture says, of yourselves. It is a gift from God. On the other hand, if you're only trusting God and you're not doing good works, you don't have purpose, okay? Because purpose comes from trusting God and living it out, making a difference. That's what we talk about here at African Community Church. Make a difference. Serve. Be involved. Trust God. Do good. 
And so friends, these two cannot be separated. If you're just doing that, you're lost. If you're just doing this, you lost purpose. You need them both together, trusting God and doing good. This, friends, is a prescription for a storm-tossed soul. And we need them both. We need them both. We need them in times of storms. And friends, I just want to remind us that God's not surprised by this pandemic. Oh, no. He's not surprised by the things that we're feeling, the things that we're facing, the emotions that we're carrying, the questions in our mind that we're pondering and that we're wondering about. And yes, I know it is confusing and there's a lot of stuff swirling. I I get that. And I get that some are mad because we can't control the storm. And I get why some are sad because the storm is controlling them. Of course, Jesus has the power to calm any storm. We know that. However, it is possible, friends, to be in a storm and still have peace. It is possible to be in a storm and not be in pieces. And I think a remedy, according to God's word, comes through trusting God, doing good. And I just invite you to recommit or to commit yourself to that today. Trusting God and doing good. 2020 does not need to go down in history as a wilderness year in your life, spiritually. Yes, it might go down as a stormy year. And yes, it may be a year filled with more questions about wonder than you ever had. But it doesn't need to be a wasted year. So allow God Invite him into those places and into the storm to reveal, to detox and to reveal his plans and his purposes. And just to commit yourselves again, just to trust God and do good. You think these pill bottles are big? You should see how big our God is. You should see how big the pills are. (laughs) Trust God. And do good. Because friends, I know something about the Lord. His love for you never changes. In the storm and out of the storm. He's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way upon you. He's not going to force you to turn to him. He'll invite you. And it's always an invitation to trust him. To heed the voice of his spirit. And to follow him even if it means getting in a boat and facing a storm by God's grace and God's peace. Now I want to invite everybody just to close their eyes for a moment. I want to give an opportunity here today for salvation and even for those that are watching online because there may be somebody in the room or someone watching online that all your life, all you've been doing is trying to do good. You're a good man, you're a good woman, but you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I want to give an invitation for salvation today Because you're in the middle of a storm. And if you're in the middle of a storm without Jesus, you're lost. In fact, your boat is shipwrecked. And there's a lot of pieces and there's a lot of mess. But there's a God that loves you. There's a God that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for every one of your pieces. And the blood of Jesus can put all those pieces back together again by you simply saying yes to Jesus. And so with every eye closed and head bowed, we only do that just as a way of eliminating distractions. If you're here today or listening online and you'd like to receive Jesus Christ, it's no special prayer. It's just actually just simply talking to God from your heart. And it can go something like this, dear Jesus, I accept that I need you. I accept the fact that I've been trying to do good stuff, but I'm empty and lost. And so Jesus, would you come into my heart today? Would you detox my spirit and mind? And Jesus, would you put the pieces back together again so that I can have peace even in the midst of the storm? And so today, Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you. I'm saying yes to you. You took 99 steps out of 100 towards me. And today, I need to take my step towards you by saying yes. And so today, right now, I just say yes to you, Jesus. 
And if that's you in the room or online, and if you're in the room, I'm just going to give you an opportunity just before the Lord. Would you just raise your hand or just saying, yep, this is me. I want to give my heart and life to Jesus Christ today. I want to give him first place. Yep, I see that hand. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you that more than anything, what matters is making your name known. And that happens by receiving you as our Lord and Savior into our heart. But Lord, I also want to pray for us as a church community today. And so I'm just going to ask everybody to stand. If you can stand. And again, in the spirit of prayer, I'd like to speak a word to anyone today or listening online that feels like God is MIA. That's missing in action. I just want to encourage you. This doesn't need to be a wasted year. I want to encourage you that God can handle every single one of your wonder questions. And, and it is possible to live at a place of peace in the midst of the storm. It's a peace that can only be found in trusting God and doing good. And so I'm going to invite you in a prayer of response. I'm going to lead you and you just declare this as a prayer over you and your family and your life. Okay? Okay. So let's pray together this prayer. Father God, I want to thank you that I am saved, I am healed, I am whole, I am blessed, I am called, and I am filled with your power. And once again today, I recommit myself to be led by your spirit, trusting you, God and doing good so that your kingdom can come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
our yes and amen. Amen? Come on. And one of those promises is that he will be faithful to complete the work he began in you. Wherever you feel stalled, plateaued, grown, regressed, here's a promise. Surrender. And I will finish the good work I started in you. You know, one of the goals I have, I was reminded of a woman I prayed for a couple weeks ago after the service during a prayer time. And I remember as I was praying for her, I had a picture of her in an open boat with waves coming in. And in that image I had and prayed over was Jesus was in the front of the boat asleep. But this woman was sitting in the center of the boat, like the floor, the oars were flapping, water coming in, and she was sitting in the center of the boat just with her knees pulled up in a contented place with her chin resting in the bow of her knees. And in the vision, I saw Jesus turn around having woken up and he looked at her and he smiled and he went back to sleep. Isn't that a beautiful picture, man? This woman, it was clear, like it was, I felt like I was being invited into an incredibly intimate moment where Jesus was sharing his pleasure over the trust a daughter had in him in the midst of a storm. I want that kind of trust. Do you want that kind of trust? I want that. And I think he's promised to do that work in us. So I want to invite the prayer teams to come forward. If you have that connect card and you put a prayer request on, if you have a tithe or an offering, can you put it in the bucket on your way out? Now friends, I want you to consider coming forward and letting the prayer team pray for greater trust for what you're facing. If you gave your life to Jesus today, can we pray for you? If you've been in the faith a long time and you're up against an obstacle that you're holding on the inside, not even talk to many people, can we pray for you? And no matter what, we're gonna pray that you go forward this week blessed, all right? And let me say a benediction. Now go and may the Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go in front of you and make a way. May he go behind you and protect you from the enemy. May he go beside you and be your friend. And may he go beneath you and pick you up when you stumble, and you and I most certainly will. Nevertheless, church, go in the love and the power of Jesus. Amen. Be blessed, folks.